Hello, everybody. Good evening. I have to confess it makes me a bit nervous. I haven't been on a stage in a public space like that in such a long time, and I'm not used to not seeing anybody anymore. On behalf of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, I welcome you all to this evening's lecture with our highly appreciated guest, Judith Simon, and our host, Toby Müller. This is a special evening for us. The last time we could physically convene for this lecture series was, believe it or not, 18 months ago in February 2000. Since this is the first time we can hold the lecture as an on-site event after one and a half years, I'm taking the opportunity to remind you of what our lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, is about. First of all, it addresses the large scale questions of digitalization, such as power, capitalism, democracy, surveillance, and their transformation. Second, it presents leading, mostly European thinkers who provide their specific views on relevant questions of our time. Among them were Manuel Castells, Elena Esposito, Marion Foucault, Nick Coldry, Shoshana Zuboff, Joseph van Dijk, and recently Jan Werner Müller. All these thinkers tend to counterbalance popular, often US American, American centric perspectives, which have come to dominate the academic discourse on the digital society. Third, the lecture series is meant to be held in an accessible format, able to reaching beyond academia and to include a conversation and Q&A. The series began in late 2017, and we are glad that ever since, <clears throat> we've been able to welcome high-profile speakers and their inspiring ideas, and tonight, of course, is no exception. Apart from one, all the previous talks are archived and can be found on the website of the High Gay, in case you're interested to watch or re-watch. Tonight's lecture is as corona-proof as possible. Despite that, sadly, it might be the only one in person this year. So please make the most of the evening and join us for food and drinks after the talk. There might be another lecture in November this year, but as we've all learned, Planning can be very volatile business these days, so this is not 100% sure yet. Before I hand over to Toby, who will properly introduce Judith, a short note on our own behalf. Both the Bundeszentrale and the HIG have worked hard to make the stressful life of the modern swing voter easier by offering specific tools to facilitate the choice in the upcoming federal and state elections in Germany. The Bundeszentrale provides the famous Valomat, which does not need further introduction since it seems to set new records in popularity with each election. The High G offers a Val Compass or Electoral Compass 2021 which gives you detailed information on the party's electoral programs regarding digital policy issues. Have a look at the HIGE's website to find out more. Tonight's lecture will address a highly relevant topic, the ethics of AI and big data, presented to us by one of the leading European researchers in this field. My thanks go to our partners and the organize, organizers who've made this even possible. And now, without further ado, please welcome Toby Müller, who will introduce Judith and share the evening. Uh, 
Hello, everybody. Good evening. I guess I'm the second supporting act of this music. This really feels like a pop music venue here. Uh, so if this was a pop music gig tonight, I would have to tell you to move closer to the stage. But you know, we all cannot do that tonight. Um, thank you so much, Jeanette Hoffmann, for your um, introduction. Thanks so much for having me here as a moderator in the fourth year. Um, I think it is already of our series Making Sense of the Digital Society. Thank you, Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung, the Federal Agency for Civic Education. We're uh, tonight here at Spindler und Klatt. It used to be a club, actually, and uh, now it's something else. Right at the shore of the river Spree, for all of us who are here live tonight in presence, actually. This is quite a feat. Um, very glad to be here. I have actually no idea what nudged you, you, now your, our present audience and the audience at home with Alexa TV and on the respective streaming websites, I have no idea what nudged you to attend this event. It is probably safe to say, though, that it wasn't an elaborate recommender system that suggested this series to you or this speaker. But could it be that I am wrong? to think you all came because of old-fashioned email lists, or even more old-fashioned, because you had been here before, live in one of, in, in one of the venues uh, we've uh, talked before in the last four years, before the pandemic started. And that you have found this series just as inspiring as I still do, even in our fourth season. But maybe you actually have been targeted by social media or by search engine ads. Or maybe the YouTube channel of this event has gathered so many views, in some cases I can actually confirm this without too much bragging, that this series is more likely to turn up high in the results of search engines. Until now I've talked about various different forms of artificial intelligence and big data, recommender systems, you know, that were popularized um, with Amazon more than 25 years ago. Uh, Netflix rise to this giant popularity of today is uh, largely due uh, to their recommender systems, actually. Um, not so much because of their films, I think. Search algorithms, ad targeting, and probably much more. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we talk about when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, and big data. This is exactly where tonight's guest comes in. She will differentiate between different types of AI and big data, and then go on to ask about the ethics, the ethics behind these different systems, especially the built-in bias, the ethical flaws, or other types of AI, and the ethics of AI regulation or improvement. We'll also talk about that. I will introduce you to her in a bit more detail in a minutes. So just a quick word to the structure of the evening after this uh, second supporting act, as I already told you, there's going to be the talk of our renowned guest, of course, for about roughly 40 minutes. I think we'll have a one-to-one -one conversation here on stage for maybe about 20 minutes, and then it's your turn here at the live venue and at home. We have a participatory tool called Slido. You can also ask questions on Twitter, I think. So we're going to have a mix of live questions here um, in the audience and, uh, you know, through digital tools. And I think pretty much in about 90 minutes, that's going to be uh, the end of our session of tonight, and uh, there's going to be drinks at the river shore. So back to our guest from Hamburg, uh, and it's actually quite of a miracle she's with us here today. You know about the strike of the Deutsche Bahn, and all other kinds of transportations are kind of hard to get to with these days. At one time of the day, we even thought about waterways, you know, that actually the Elbe connects to the Havel, and this would have been one possibility to get her here, but she managed. So she came here from Hamburg, where she's a professor of ethics and in information technology at the University of Hamburg. She's also a member of the German Ethics Council, Deutsche Ethikrat, since 2018. And she was part of the Data Ethics Commission of the German federal government, the Datenethik Commission, who published the report in late 2019. She single-handedly edited the Routledge Handbook of Trust and Philosophy that was published about a year and a half ago. Her academic background lies in psychology, then philosophy, which she studied in Vienna, in Vienna, among other places. And at an early stage in her career, she also tested software for its usability before continuously working on the intersection of philosophy, tech, and science at various universities from Paris to Stanford and Barcelona. 
The longest trips nowadays, or so it seems, as I told you already, are those from one German city to another, from Hamburg uh, to Berlin. So glad she was able to make it. She's with us tonight. Please welcome Judith Simon. That's bright. Okay, I'm a bit smaller, so I guess I have to move the, uh, the microphones. I'm very happy to be here as well. I can't see you at all, I have to say right now. And it's a bit strange after one and a half years of just doing everything via Zoom to be in front of an audience, even if you don't see them. Um, so without further ado, let me just uh, well, tell you what I'm going to talk about today. The title of my talk, as was announced, is The Ethics of Big Data and AI. <coughs> and I think I need to open a water bottle. Just give me a second. And this is the outline. I'll first briefly talk about um, what ethics has to do with AI to begin with and why should we even think about ethics in the context of artificial intelligence. I'll then very briefly talk about how I view AI and big data and then point you to some ethical challenges for and of artificial intelligence before I end with some conclusions. Um, in recent years, quite a number of ethical about policy papers um, were published that often made reference to ethics. The Data Ethics Commission's uh, report was mentioned before, but also the uh, report by the high-level expert group on AI, on artificial intelligence by the European Commission also labeled their report ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. So there seems to be an interest in talking about ethics when you talk about artificial intelligence. Why is that? Let me first point you to, you know, what, what is ethics all about to get you started? Well, first of all, you know, ethics asks very fundamental questions about what is good and what is bad. Put differently, what is right and what is wrong? And if you look more at the agent supposed to do something, you would ask what can we do and what should we do or what must we do or what can we not do or must we not do and for what reasons, right? What are the reasons for us for considering something good or bad? If you, if you look from this angle on artificial intelligence, it basically, the first question is, what is good and bad AI, right? Or put differently, what can we do with AI and for what reasons, or sh what should we not do with AI and what, for what reasons? These are the bas basic ethical questions that you ask, in, that you may want to ask in, in relation to, um, to AI. And if you strive for something labeled good artificial intelligence, then, and that's already a premise that I'm making, then to my mind, scientifically and technologically good AI is necessary, but not sufficient for ethically good AI. And why that's the case, I'll get back to that later on. Because, and, and also at some instances, there may be ethical reasons for not using AI, even if it's near perfect, right? There may be reasons for not using AI, for instance, in warfare, even if this was better at discerning, um, let's say, soldiers um, from citizens to begin with, right? So there may be other reasons except from it being uh, scientifically or technologically good. So I'm teaching ethics and in information technologies at the University of Hamburg, and if, when I'm talking also to my students, I try to dis dis disentangle three different roles of ethics for information technologies. And these are the ethics of the profession, the ethics of use, and the ethics of design. Let me walk you through e each of them. The ethics of profession is the first angle of looking at the intersection of computer science broadly conceived and ethics. And what it usually does, it looks at the designers and developers of software and asks how they should behave ethically in designing and developing software. And you can find lots of codes of conduct. This is the one by the German Informatics Society, which gives you indication of how you're supposed to behave as an, you know, good member of this, of your career, of your profession, uh, if, you, if you want to strive to these ethical guidelines. And this is, of course, the oldest way. You may compare it with the ethics in the medical field, where there are also guidelines on how medical, the medical professions are supposed to behave. The second angle of looking at ethics in relation to information technology is the ethics of use. And here you don't look to the designers and developers, but to the users and to the usage of information technologies. And I just pointed some questions there to give you an idea about what type of questions you may want to ask if you think about the ethics in the use of information technologies. You may ask, should individuals be allowed to post racist comments online? Or what should I do about this? Or you may ask, for what purpose can we use customer data? 
or how should governments protect citizen data and how to weigh different values and interests. And what this already points you to is that users can come in very different forms. They can be individuals, they can be companies, but they can also be governments. And they are all, what, what makes them specific is that they have not been developing technology, but they are using it for specific purposes. And here, ethical issues arise as well. The third and most recent way of thinking about ethics in relation to information technology is through the ethics of design. And here you don't look into onto the designers or the users, but you look into the technology itself. And basically, it boils down to two different tasks. One is the ethical analysis of existing technologies, and the second is the ethical design of novel technologies. So underlying this idea that you, I mean, you must first ask, how could you even analyze technologies as an artifact, as a tool from an ethical angle. And the underlying idea is that computer ethics as the domain from which you know, AI ethics and all this may come from should not just study ethical issues in the use of computer technology, but also the technology itself. And what is underlying is, of course, the idea that technology is not neutral, but that computer software and systems and software are not morally neutral, and it is possible to identify tendencies in them to promote or demote particular moral norms and values. And if that's the case, then you can analyze technologies for how they are affecting uh, values and norms, how they may be either strengthening, for instance, privacy or undermining them, right? The second task, if that's the case, if technology is not neutral, you may as well strive for designing technology in a way that conforms to societally held values. And that has been a topic in the field called values in design or value sensitive design already since the 1990s. And here I have a quote from a game designer, Mary Flanagan. She writes, if an ideal world is one in which technologies promote not only instrumental values, such as functional efficiency, safety, reliability, and ease of use, but also substantive social, moral, and political values to which societies and their people subscribe, then those who design systems have a responsibility to take these latter values as well as the former into consideration as they work. I'm not going to go into details, but just to give you a pointer, of course, you know, the question is how do you get this done? How do you get to think about, um, so the idea is basically in values in design and value sensitive design to account for values such as privacy, transparency, fairness, when designing and developing technologies. And of course, ideally, you, have, you, you collaborate between social scientists, philosophers, and computer scientists to do that. And I'm not going to, we can maybe talk about this later, but that's probably what we're, that's partly what we're also doing in Hamburg. This is very different from what Virginia Dignam has called ethics by design, which is about the technical integration of ethical reasoning capabilities into autonomous systems, right? This is what I'm not talking about. What I'm talking about right now is rather how can we um, make sure that certain um, values but also uh, rights that we have are still valid and accounted for when we're delegating certain decisions to automated decision-making systems. So, to summarize this, these are the three different viewpoints of ethics in IT. You either may look at those who are developing systems, those who are using them in the different forms in which they come, or you may want to look into the te technology itself. Let me now move to artificial intelligence and big data, because it's a bit peculiar, and it is a bit of a challenge also to how values in, desi in design can be conceived. So this is, you know, as, as a philosopher, you know, if I need a reference, I always, I'm always looking to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy because it gives you quite concise, uh, short, uh, short notes. And this is a definition of artificial intelligence, which is characterized as the subfield of computer science devoted to developing programs that enable computers to display behavior that can broadly be characterized as intelligent. Most research in AI is devoted to very narrow applications, such as planning or speech-to-speech -speech translation in limited, well-defined task domains. But substantial interest remains in the long-range goal of building generally intelligent autonomous agents, even if the goal of fully human-like intelligence is elusive and is seldom pursued explicitly and as such. And this is also what I'm least interested in. I'm much more interested in the very mundane, everyday usage of what's now called artificial intelligence. 
If you look into the history of artificial intelligence, there have always been, there have been lots of summers and winters, lots of periods when there was a lot of hype and interest in artificial intelligence, and then again phases in which both the interest and the funding was decreasing. And right now we're living again in a current summer of AI, what you may see from, you know, how funding is spent on artificial intelligence, all the hope that surrounds artificial intelligence. And the underlying reason why there has been uh, another progress or shift in what is now conceived as AI is um, the existence of quite massive amounts of data that can be used for statistical analysis. So if I were to summarize what is currently, the current debate about artificial intelligence very often focuses on machine learning as a specific type of statistical analysis. So the core of many of these things that are now being captured under the heading of artificial intelligence is basically statistical analysis of big data, including machine learning, for the purpose of pattern recognition, classification, prediction, and decision support so in such uh, as, as uh, uh, automated decision support systems. I just pointed you some um, some logos in here just to give an idea. Of course, you know, machine learning and AI is in speech uh, in speech recognition and recommender systems in all sorts of um, search algorithms. Also, of course, in facial recognition, if this is used in cameras. And I'm going to get to this case of, um, you know, this, um, this is a, a quite famous or infamous software called Camp Compass, which is used to predict the likelihood of somebody reoffending. I'm going to get back to that later on. But what I'm trying to get at in all these cases, many of these systems are b based on data, and this data is being analyzed in order to make, um, to, to classify and to support decision making processes. What you can already see from just these you know, very few examples which I pointed to um, through these logos and pictures is that there's a vast diversity, complexity, and dynamics of both the technologies, but also the very different contexts in which these technologies are being developed or applied. And as a consequence, of course, the ethical issues are also quite diverse and complex and changing over time. What I'm therefore advocating both in trying to understand um, ethical issues related to AI and big data, but also when it comes to the governance in these domains, is an ecosystem's perspective on data and AI. Because very often we're dealing with data flows between different actors, uh, and there are very different junctions and points we need to look at where either ethical issues emerge or where there may be soft spots for governance. So let me now turn to some specific ethical challenges of and for AI. The first issue that, of course, comes to people's mind when they think about um, AI is, of course, especially when we're talking about machine learning based on large amount of data, are challenges to privacy. And of course, this is a, this is a, um, a graphic from Wolfi Christel from his publications. Um, if, you if you look at um, the data brokerage system that is underlying the online marketing, that basically makes us very transparent. So all the data that is being used now for classification, for recommendation, for search engines, for all these, especially for recommendations, is based on very fine-grained profiling of what we are doing online, uh, for, of our whereabouts, or where we're clicking, what we're liking, etc. Um, and on this, the, you, um, on this, basically, you do lots of predictions on very sensitive topics. I'm not going to go into the details, and that on the top right is, um, is a graphic from a publication from Kuczynski, which was also quite infamous, in which he was looking um, how well he can uh, predict ethnicity or gender just from, a, from a very few um, Facebook clicks, basically. Or what you liked on Facebook was highly predictive of your gender or ethnicity. So what you're doing online is leaving lots of traces. All this is fed into these database systems, and it's a challenge to privacy. Of course, you know, it doesn't, shouldn't come as a surprise that facial recognition is yet another technology that both relies on machine learning and AI and is also highly invasive in terms of um, in, uh, your privacy. While privacy is the first target, the first value that often comes to people's mind as being infringed by these database technologies. The second, of course, has to do with the domain of bias and fairness. Let's stick to facial recognition for a moment. So if it works perfectly, it means that people know your whereabouts. If you imagine a world where you have cameras all over and facial recognition technologies employed, it would basically mean you're quite transparent to the state in terms of where your whereabouts. The problem is, however, that they are not working well. That may, be, that may be good, but it may also be bad, right? What you can see on the left-hand side, this is, this is from a publication from the MIT lab, from Timnit Gebru and Joy Boalomini. 
What you can see is from the major, um, the major software uh, packages that do facial recognition from Microsoft, Face, and IBM, what you can see is they are close to perfect when it comes to white male faces, but their accuracy goes goes massively down um, if you uh, for um, for dark-skinned female faces. So there, there there is a certain bias in the accuracy um, in terms of some people get more easily recognized, and for others the the error ratio is just much much higher. So you may think, well, you know, that at least gives me a bit more uh, um, privacy possibly, but the problem is, of course, if based upon these recognition action is taken, such as the Berliner Südkreuz, but also if this is used for uh, criminal um, uh, investigations, being, re being falsely identified may really pa pause um, uh, lots of issues for people who are already, or for, pe for, for groups of persons who have already been disadvantaged in other fields. Let's stick to bias and fairness for a moment, because of course these issues with bias in uh, automated decision-making systems are not only the case in the facial recognition software, and of course they may in principle be solved if, uh, because the, the source is very often the training data, but not always. Um, similar thing happened in, in an algorithm that is distributing people to different types of care and therapy in, in, the, in the United States. And here's a quote from this article. The study published in Science on the 24th of October last year concluded that the algorithm was less likely to refer black people than white people who were equally sick to programs that aim to improve care for patients with complex medical needs. Hospitals and insurers use the algorithm and others like it to help manage care for about 200 million people in the US each year. So it's massive, right? The impact of this software affects 200 million people. It's not just a minor thing, right? It's a massive thing. Um, this, what is also important, what I found from this article is that they write this type of study is rare because researchers often cannot gain access to proprietary algorithms and the rearms of sensitive health data needed to fully test them. There's some music coming up. <laughs> um, and that is, of course, the case that I was uh, describing just prior. Um, this is the uh, ADM system called Compass, which is used in the, um, in the court system in the US to, to give a risk score to people indicating the likelihood of people who have already offended to re-offend in the future. And it was shown by the, um, by the um, article ProPublica that this software is highly biased uh, against um, Afro-Americans. Meaning that even if the average accuracy is similar for white Americans and Afro-American Americans, the, the direction of error is the opposite. So as a white American, you have a much higher likelihood of being classified as is not going to reoffend despite you reoffending. And for Afro-Americans, it's exactly the other way around. So you're much more likely to be classified. You're going to reoffend with a higher risk score than is merited. The problem with this one, and this has steered quite a debate, is that, of course, this is also proprietary software. So it was only through, basically, an analysis of the outputs that you could infer the internal workings of this software. So what we can see here is, first of all, a justice problem. Societal stereotypes and prejudices, but also existing inequalities and injustice are frequently inscribed into technologies. Intention, of course, you know, the intentional discrimination is possible, but mostly this is unintentional through either the training data or different methodological choices. When you're designing ADM systems, you have to choose different types of data, and they may be more or less adequate, for instance, on white-skinned faces or on darker-skinned faces, as was the case for facial recognition. Or um, you may have certain choices for target variables which are also affecting different groups of people differently. So especially data-based automated decision-making systems really run the risk of cementing the status quo if historical data on previous practice are used to predict the future, right? If you are a company who is historically discriminated against women because you gave them li uh, less um, um, promotions, right, this will be in your data, and if you use the same data to make prediction about future promotions, you will just repeat the pattern. Moreover, this issue can often not be assessed and addressed because of a dual transparency problem. 
This dual transparency problem basically comprises of two issues. The first is what I call functional opacity, the lack of access to proprietary algorithmic systems. Because very often, and of course there are reasons partly for that, data and algorithms are considered property and they are important for some competitive advantage. And what we've also been already been investigating, for instance, in the Data Ethics Commission is the question, what are the possibilities and limitations of different types of assessments and audits for algorithmic systems? Some may be ex ante, before, runtime, some ex post, and for some you may need, need real-time assessment. The second is epistemic opacity, and that relates to the limited understanding of complex systems, and they may be based on machine learning, but need not be. Um, what is important here, so this refers to the problem of understanding why a system decided in a particular instance, in a particular way, if the system is very complicated. And very often in machine learning, this even for the experts, it's not fully comprehensible um, how the system um, went about in classifying and in, in, in making its predictions. The problem is also that this transparency is user relative and it's task relative. If I want to know why I was denied a credit, I don't want to know how the system works in general. I just want to know what, is, what should I have done different in order to obtain a credit. This is what you call counterfactual explanation. You want to know what I should have done different in order to get a credit. This is very different from somebody auditing the system, trying to make sure that women and men are treated equal by the system. So we basically have at least a dual task for um, for ethical or fairness uh, for ethical AI, and this is um, this is framed very often under fairness, accountability, and transparency. And as a result to this uh, Compass scandal, um, there has been quite a number of publications and also a community within machine learning, uh, which has been organizing for several years now, the conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency, addressing these issues with from within computer science. But let me point to some of the challenges that, that go about addressing these issues which I just raised within computer science. What you need to distinguish first is a distinction between discrimination aware data mining and fair machine learning. First of all, if you want to make sure that the system is not systematically discriminating against certain user groups, be they divided by gender or by skin color or whatever, there are different methods for detecting, measuring, and also preventing or minimizing discrimination. But the problem is you can't satisfy all of them at once. Right? You won't have a system that does not discriminate, discriminate against any of the user groups. The problem is also if you want to turn this positively, not only trying to avoid discriminating, but trying to make things fair, right? Because you may want to counter for injustice that have, has happened before, it becomes even more trickier. Because there are different accounts and also mathematical measures of fairness, and re they require choice and justification. So which measure of fairness is most appropriate in a given context? Just think about the elections. In the case of elections, everyone has one vote. Right? This is our conception of fairness in that particular instance. When it comes to taxes, this is a very different story. So depending on the sector, we have very different and also contested notions of justice. So if you want to inscribe those, you need to decide which is the most appropriate. Which variables are legitimate grounds for differential treatment? Why should you be allowed to treat people differently, right? You must have reasons for that. And providing these reasons and arguing about these, this is what ethics is partly about. Or put differently, should fairness consist of ensuring everyone has equal probability of it obtaining some benefit, or should we instead aim to minimize the harms to the least advantaged? And if you just think about the corona one and a half years we had, like all of these debates, when of course not only debating in regards to AI, but also in other uh, very daily uh, mundane facts. So what I'm trying to get at is the focus on discrimination prevention in machine learning is necessary, but it's not sufficient for just or ethical AI. The focus also on methods within machine learning, for instance, on data preparation, model learning, and post-processing are also necessary in order to make sure that your systems are not discriminatory, but again, they are not sufficient for ethical AI. Political theory and also ethics may be sources for reflection on, on fairness and justice, and they may guide appropriate methodological choices, but these choices are always context-dependent and contested. 
So the task of deciding on specific fairness measures should not be placed on the shoulders of developers on their own because of their highly political character. And depending on the impact, this may require very broad public debate and participation. Of course, you don't want to debate every ADM system that is, that is basically spitting out what comes out of the, you know, you don't need to have this debate on any type of ADM systems, but in particular those that are very invasive or are impacting a large number of people, this is when you need public debate. So let me end with my conclusions. The challenges for good AI are manifold. I just pointed you to a number of them, and I could have gone on for quite some while. Um, they re refer to privacy, bias, discrimination, lack of transparency, and lack of accountability. And what I'm trying to also, partly what I'm telling my students is that ethics is in the method, but it also goes beyond it. What I mean by that is, ethic is ethics within computer science, education, but also in the practice of designing systems, it's not, nothing that comes at the end when you think about the impact. It's something that you need to think about in the process of designing systems, because you need to think about it when you're choosing your data, when you're choosing your methods, when you're deciding on how to optimize and what to optimize for. On the other hand, this is not yet enough, right? Because some of the problems can have their origin in the data or in the methodological choices, but others may just be reflecting injustice that we have in society. And then there is no technological fix for what really is a societal issue, right? So addressing ethical issue, uh, challenges requires various instruments and stakeholders within technology design, but also beyond it. And what I also want to point you to, of course, almost at the very end is, I've been f looking a lot at, you know, what the problem is if AI does not what it's supposed to do, right? When it's, when it's faulty and when it makes mistakes. But we should probably also worry a little bit about when AI is exactly doing what it's supposed to do, because it's a lot about the metrification of your life and about giving everyone, everyone what he or she deserves. And I'm not sure this is what I want in every realm of my public and private life. Lastly, let me end on a note on the relation between ethics, politics, and law. Um, what I'm trying to get at is, what I find important is to acknowledge the relation between these three domains and the differences instead of either going towards ethics washing or ethics bashing. So what do I mean by that? There has been quite intense, and rightly so, uh, public debate and outrage on, on ethics washing and the idea that you, know, you put ethics at a label at something in order to avoid regulation. And there is a tendency on that, and of course, you know, this is a huge problem. On the other hand, this does not mean that ethics per se is useless, right? Ethics is basically, as I tried to say at the beginning, reflecting on what is good and what is bad and what the reasons are for deciding what is right and what is wrong. And that's something that we need to do every day in our daily life, and we also need to do this in regards to technology. This does neither replace politics nor law, nor does it make it superfluous. Right? Ethics is, of course, influencing law and decision making because we have different views and values and are weighing values differently. We have different notions of justice. There's also political debate on how we should weigh different values. So I think we must acknowledge that there is a relation between ethics, law, and politics, that they are all related to each other, but of course must prevent that ethics is misused as something of just trying to get rid of hard regulation. And with that, I end and I hopefully stayed in time. Thank you so much, Judith, Simon. I think this was um, the one and only time where a speaker was actually shorter than uh, predicted uh, in the first place. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, very concise and tight uh, talk. Uh, things are going to slow down a little bit now, I guess, due to my Swiss origin. So uh, please forgive me uh, for that. Um, let me just take up a notion towards the end of your talk, Judith. Um, is it fair to say that you said it's very hard for AI not to discriminate, right? And you also said um, this responsibility of discriminating or not discriminating should not be shouldered by developers alone. So we need a broader uh, social discourse on how to uh, sort of distribute uh, that responsibility or to improve. Uh, anti-discriminatory uh, coding uh, or AI or systems, whatever you want to call it. Now, I think 
we're probably living in a time where we have social movements as strong as we hadn't had them for like 50 years when it comes to discrimination, to uh, identities being hurt or not being hurt, uh, to racism, sexism, and so forth. We're, it's, it's, really, it's a really forceful time when it comes to those subjects. Now, if you tell them um, all those movements being so active globally now, if you tell them it's very hard not to discriminate, uh, now how would you say we should structure this discourse, you know, in order not to shoulder all this responsibility on the developers. What's to do there? I think it really depends on, um, on the system at stake, right? If it's a very high stake system, let's assume, let's stick for a moment to this Compass software, right? Just to have yeah. a case. Um, and if you have a software where you can show that um, it's, it's of very high impact, right? Because it's, uh, it's making a prediction that has, has an influence on whether people go to jail or not, whether they get probation, whether they, how high the bail is. This is very high impact, right? And of course, the, the standards for showing how, um, what you did to ensure that your system is not discriminating must be higher. So the very least, you know, there should be some auditing that shows these are the means, these are the measures, that, that these are the steps that we have taken to test whether our system is not discriminating against at least salient groups, those groups that are most notoriously negatively affected, right? Of course, you, you may never have a system that is not discriminated against any group, right? Because groups could be as random as, you know, people that go to uh, New Zealand for vacation are wearing red, red socks and are fans of... I don't know what soccer club, right? So th this may be this distinct group which may, for some reason, because it's a database system, discriminated by that, right? You can't test for all of these, of all of these basically artificially generated groups. But what you can certainly do is at least test for those that are inscribed by the law, right? Because in the mm. law you have certain certain categories according to which people should not be discriminated, and at least for those you should check. But even then, it may be the case that you can't optimize for all of them to the same extent. But at least you should lay it open so it, that it's contestable. So it's the developers and it's the law. And what other kind of agency would, come, would have to come into this discourse, what do you think? Well, the developers are usually the ones who get a task that they have to solve and they have to optimize it in a certain way, right? You have the people who are basically buying a system and those who are selling a system, and those are, those are already not the developers, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the economic context in which these systems are being bought and sold. And especially if the state is using those, uh, I think the standards must be even higher, right? The higher the impact is and also for the state. And if, of course, you know, um, the, the groups you need to enroll may differ depending on what is at stakes, right? If, um, um, so you have different, have different representative groups that you may want to enroll in particular when it comes to high impact um, um, tools, right? If, if you have a system that is discriminating against Afro-Americans, of course they must be represented sure. in, in, in some sort of committee addressing and testing this. Mm -hmm. Again, I've got this uh, uh, live music arena uh, moment right now where I would like to ask the technicians to give me a little bit more of 2D Simon on the monitor. That's what musicians usually do. This is my moment. I'm very grateful for it. Please turn her up on the monitor a little bit on stage. It's hard to hear. Thank you so much. Um, so this is uh, one of your key uh, fields, of course, is trust uh, uh, in the philosophical uh, sense in AI. What we talked about now is actually trust into machines that do not discriminate as much as they have discriminated uh, in many cases, uh, apparently. Um, now, there's one very interesting notion um, you mentioned in a paper I read, um, and it is there are certain instances where we're not to trust AI at all. There are certain uh, systems, actually, where it would be better to say, no, let's not build trust. Uh, but let's not trust the systems at all. So deny trust, so to speak. Could you explore on that a little bit or what systems you had in mind when you uh, developed the negation of trust, actually? Yeah, I mean, to begin with, as, as, as a philosopher, um, we're very skeptical of trust, right? Mm -hmm. So usually you don't want trust, you want trustworthiness. And you don't want people to be gullible and just trustworthy. The last thing you want is blind trust in something. Usually a lot of, you know, there's also, there has been very little interest in philosophy for a long time in trust. Sorry. There has been little interest in, in trust in philosophy for quite some time because it was more focused on knowledge and evidence and not being gullible and trusting. 
people, right? So usually you, you should only trust those who are trustworthy, right? And those who are not trustworthy, you shouldn't trust them. So trust is not valuable per se, but only if it's directed at those who end up to be trustworthy. So what I'm focusing on both in research, but also when it, in general, but also when it comes to AI, is first establishing criteria for trustworthiness instead of just, you know, fostering trust. Because, you know, the downside of trusting somebody who's not trustworthy, either because he's incompetent or because he's ill-willed, they are disastrous, right? So you don't want to have trust per se, but you want to make sure and say, how much checks and balances do I need, right? The interest in trust just acknowledges that we can never know everything to the core. At some point, we need to trust either other people or we trust, need to trust some evidence. And at some point, it must be good enough if we don't have certainty. And where exactly this tipping point is when it's good enough to be trusted, this is what I think is interesting. But certainty is a very difficult category when it comes to um, statistical engineering, uh, when it comes to recognition patterns and so forth, those systems are not about certainty. They're about some equation to certainty yeah. or maybe, uh, uh, you know, but it's not identical to what we would call certainty. And this is what trust is linked to, right? Doesn't, doesn't that make it tremendously difficult, actually, to talk about even trustworthiness? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that, that makes the notion of trust so interesting. It's because mm -hmm. there are so little things that are certain um, that mm -hmm. most of the stuff is in between, right? It's in between blind trust and certainty. Um, but how actually to discern this is, is, is interesting on itself. There have been people who, there has been quite a lot of debate of whether you can actually talk about trustworthiness when it comes to AI to begin with, mm -hmm. right? Because there is now this notion of trustworthy AI and everybody's striving towards this. I think the notion of trustworthiness in regards to technologies only makes sense if you understand them as a socio-technical system, not as a technology per se, yeah. because you can't trust a technology, you can rely on it, mm -hmm. right? But you, trusting, you, you can only trust, let's say, the socio-technical network behind it, sort of like the institutions guiding it, um, the standards enrolled, the, the, the mechanisms of accountability that are behind it, but not the technology per se. I would like to talk a little bit about the relation of the ethics of design and the ethics of use. Uh, you hinted at at one time um, of your talk. Um, in other words, to put it quite plainly, actually, um, can you determine ethical use by ethical design? No, you can't. Um, of course not, right? I mean, you can try your best, uh, and you can try. I mean, you you know, you can you can mess it up, and you can still, you know, let's assume you you buy a car, right? And when the first people bought a car, they probably did not foresee all the mess that came afterwards, right? And still, you know, you can you may be able to use a car as an installation, right? And then the moment it's used as an installation, it doesn't have any of the side effects it has as a car, which you use to driving from A to B. So any artifact can be used and misused for various purposes. So this is not in the hands of the people designing it. Nonetheless, when you're designing things, you're making, you're, you're basically you're creating affordances and constraints. You're, you're, you're nudging a technology in order to make things harder or easier. When you're designing a system, you can either make it privacy friendly or not, right? And of course, people can always circumvent it, but it gets harder or, or, or easier. So of course, you can never entirely forecast future use, but you can make better or worse use more or less likely. And that's the power you have, which I think is already quite a lot. But of course, you know, people can always circumvent your plans. Would open source be a concept that sort of um, enhances um, ethical design of um, technology that would make it more lasting, so to speak, in it, terms of ethical use? Yeah, at least it, it provides one central component of more ethical development. It's mutual critique, right? When you mm -hmm. make something open, people can check for it, right? And they can see whether it works and how it works, and they can contest it. And I think this is something that's very important. And one of the cases where we have been debating this is, for instance, the Corona Van app, Right? No. which has been a case where, uh, where there was a decision to make it open source after some detours at the beginning and lots of flaws. But anyway, let's look at the result at the very end and let's not look at the communication afterwards. But the process of developing it was sort of like um, one of these cases where really public money was also spent um, in, 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 uh, on an open source project and it really improved through the feedback of others. This does not mean that in principle this is ethical, right? but it provides some, some characteristics that may make it easier for flaws to be detected and also for problems to be detected, and that already helps. 
I told you I was going to be a little bit slower than you, uh, Julie, so please uh, give me those seconds. Um, what you talked about um, most of the time, correct me if I'm wrong here, is weak AI. It's so-called weak AI and not strong AI. Strong AI being, now the, here's the big word, the singularity, uh, the superhuman uh, uh, agency, so to speak, that surpasses uh, human uh, capacity as a singularity. We talked about, you talked about very specific tailored applications, you know, like medical diagnosis, cancer recognition, news feeds, credit scoring, uh, predictive policing, and so forth. So uh, ethics probably make more sense with weak AI. Is it easier to build trust in weak systems? As people who know, we may know, um, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of all these debates on strong AI because, I, you know, in a nutshell, if I were to I be honest, I would say I couldn't care less, right? Uh -huh. there, so, there, we have so many issues that we have to face um, before we can deal with some fantasy of singularity and strong air that, I, mm -hmm. that I'd rather spend my limited amount of energy on these issues, right? And leave the speculation about strong AI to other people because it's a lot of fantasy of rich techno enthusiast of certain skin color and gender, uh, which I find a bit boring. So let me, in a nutshell, I think there are more pressing and more interesting things to spend my time on um, than strong AI. Mm -hmm. And is it easier to work with weak systems? There are no strong systems. Mm -hmm. There is no comparison, right? It's not that it's easier, just that there is no such thing as strong AI. So the comparison doesn't make sense. What I want to hint at is um, that you would think if you compared like a human, human bias um, with a built-in machine bias, so to speak, that the latter would be much easier to fix, right? I mean, uh, we've spent uh, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years now uh, not overcoming uh, just terrible uh, forms of... Uh, discrimination, of war, of uh, genocide, uh, and so forth, apparently that is very hard to fix in the human DNA. Now, if you have a, a, a system, the, all the systems, the weak AI systems you talked about, uh, I would assume as a layman it would be much easier to actually fix that problem or those problems you addressed because you can actually build them in there into the software. Is this correct? to fix the systems for weak or strong AI, sorry, weak. for weak AI. Well, the, the problem basically is, is that, as I was trying to get at, much of what is di discussed now under the heading of AI is basically data-based systems that run on historical data. So yep. all the bias that you have in there sure. are just going to be reproduced. So you could, of course, in principle, fix them, but I still don't, maybe I don't get the comparison with this. I think it would be a lot easier to fix quasi the database uh, uh, in comparison to the human mindset. That's what I was hinting ah, at. Ah, to the human mind. Yeah, of, I mean, of course, you know, if, if I could fix um, the, the discrimination and the stereotypes of the rest of the world beyond the data sets, I'd be very happy, right? But of course, we can't do this. But the problem is, just because we human beings are also... Um, biased and are discriminating people doesn't mean we should be okay with discriminatory ADM systems. Sure. No. But do you think there's progress there? there is Not in the human mm -hmm. mind, but do you think that uh, there's actually a chance of those AI systems, AI systems you talked about, that we progress much more rapidly yeah. uh, than we apparently have? So. On the good side, let's assume, first of all, there is interest in, in de-biasing and discrimination aware machine learning, so there is at least the problem sensitivity. Mm. That's already something. Second, you could, of course, you know, the way you use these systems is pretty much open. You know? Instead of just replicating the status quo, you could use it for different purposes. What you do with your system is up to you. Let's assume the system learns, and I'm using this stupid example for quite some time, that uh, judges are harsher in their verdicts before the lunch break, right? And um, even if it's a fictitious, just take it as an example. And if this is learned, then you can either just reproduce it and replace the verdict by the judge by an equally biased system of the machine, or you can make a pointer to the human judge and say, look, it's just before lunchtime, maybe you want to reconsider whether you're hungry and how this affects your decision making, right? And this would be more of a pointer where machine learning is used in order to improve the decision making of a human by sort of like giving him or her feedback on what, they, what, what, uh, what the system has learned about the biases. So this is, this is a more positive uh, way of using this. On the other hand, right, um, 
I'm not sure how optimistic I should be about the willingness uh, of large portions of, or the majority of the population to even get rid of that, right? Um, so that's, you know, let's wait for the next elections and then we'll see. Another difficult question before I'd like to open this up to you and uh, um, uh, everybody participating through the participatory tool Slido and also Twitter. Let's see what's on there, but one big question uh, before we do that, I think. Um, is again back to trust. I mean, of course, this series is a little bit about that also all the time that we um, trying to talk about the European role in this geopolitical race uh, that is going on on technology right now, on cloud computing and AI and so forth that you've uh, um, written a lot about uh, trust in AI from a European perspective. Uh, also, you worked for the da Data Ethics uh, Commission. Um, and there's four... Um, measures, actually, that uh, the Data Ethics Commission proposes to increase trust in AI. And of course, this is a geopolitical uh, asset, too, actually, Europe is trying to develop, right? And those four um, things would be, one, respect for the human autonomy, two, prevention of harm, three, fairness, four, explicability. So that's plain ethics, I would say. The thing is, how is this implemented? What do you, if you... Um, if you advise like different boards, if you talk to politicians, how do you implement that? How do you implement that so that, that there is actually, um, you know, pro European progress in order to survive this race? In other words, to put it a little bit dramatically. Mm, I'm, I'm trying to distinguish two questions where I think we're underlying. The one is, um, how, do you do, how do you make sure that these, that these goals get accomplished? And I think what you need to do is you need to make stuff mandatory, right? Things doesn't happen if it's voluntary, right? If you just say you can do some auditing or you cannot do it, that's not, you know, you, you're not going to get explainability and fairness and all these nice things that we should take for granted if you don't make certain auditing mandatory for at least um, systems of high impact, right? Mm. Um, of course, then the second question is how does Europe stand in relation to, in particular currently, China and the US, and yeah. what could be this third way of trustworthy AI? I mean, I don't want to end, you know, shouldn't end on a, on a very pessimistic note, but you know, we're not there's, ending there's, yet. <laughs> but there's hardly, I mean, there currently is no such thing as as European sovereign data sovereignty, right? Uh -huh. Because we neither have a sovereign infrastructure, no data markets, and it certainly doesn't help if you have um, initiatives which in principle may be valuable, such as Gaia X, and then you yeah. partner with people like Palantir, right? Th uh -huh. this, is, this is not how this is going to fly. Um, Gaia X being the European cloud com yeah. uh, computing uh, project that is not doing too good at the moment. That's maybe just to summarize it real quickly. Well, the point is just, you know, if, if you really want to have an alternative, you must design an alternative, right? Mm -hmm. And there, I think on a, on a local level, you have alternatives uh, where you have more um, uh, public, open source, uh, open data initiatives in, 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 in cities. You need to come up, I mean, we tried, we, we came up with some ideas about also data sharing between companies, to what extent also maybe companies need to make data available, especially large companies need to make data available for the public good. Um, and I think these, these are steps that need to be taken and there's a thin line between a new, let's say, regionalism and, and closing basically your own infrastructure, but at the same time also at least trying to have some um, um, yeah, control over your technological infrastructure and not being entirely dependent on the, the technological infrastructure on, on, let's say, China and on the database, on the data to, to the US. So, so you need to have to come up with something, but I don't, no, I didn't want to end to be so negative. Um, Let's be a bit more optimistic. There's still time. We're, we're, we're not at the end yet. Yeah, <laughs> There's a lot me, of questions me, to come. You see me a bit frustrated on that on that uh, debate because it's very often about this uh, about this race between China and, and the US and Europe. Um, and I think if, if Europe were to stand together and had some joint ideas about how to come up with a with a more public, more open, more transparent alternative, mm. it could be. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, we have already to a certain degree set standards with the general data protection regulation, right? So the question is, what do the other upcoming acts, what impacts will be, you know, first of all, how will um, acts such as the Data Governance Act or the Digital Services Act mm. end up? Will they basically totally give in to lobbying? Yeah. Um, because then you can just throw them in the dustbin. And, no, you can't. But at least you should try to make sure that it's not 
totally hijacked by, by lobbying. And then the question is to what extent can these, um, these standards also play a role worldwide? Not a very satisfactory answer, I know. Thank you so much. Um, before we uh, move to the questions from the audience, uh, nur eine letzte Frage, ob man die Monitore ein bisschen aufdrehen kann. Ich höre fast alles von vorne mit sehr viel Halb. Wenn das noch möglich wäre, vielen, vielen Dank. Schon viel besser. Danke. Uh, okay, let's take questions from the audience. I don't see anything. Is Christian Graufogel there uh, with the microphone? We start with the audience, then go to Slido. I don't see it. I'm sorry. Somebody in the audience has to... <laughs> Do that for me. Okay, there you go. Uh, two questions. Uh, did you follow today's hearing at the European Parliament where, where Vestager was basically preparing the key things of DSA and what is the other thing, ACRAN, DMA or whatever? <laughs> Uh, for one, and if, if not, what would be the, the critical ingredients from, let th let's say, an ethical perspective that should be included in properly in updating the DSA as it is at the moment? So first of all, I did not follow anything. I was, I was trying to get you on the train, and that turned out to be a bit more tricky, I have to say. Um, um, so, I mean, I think... <sighs> I won't be able to get in a lot of detail, to be frank, right? But I think the, the underlying idea is um, how do you make sure that that um, the, the public good is basically at, at the the core idea of how to structure this, this European data market, right? Because there's so much interest um, from... Could, in, could be getting in, sometimes a bit even more... Um, I should stop getting negative, right? But there is a lot of interest in, in, in using data for commercial purposes, and I think um, that's partly fine, right? Um, but I think there should be a much larger thrust in, uh, in using it for the public good. And that's not very detailed, but it's probably as, as detailed as I can be for the moment. This one here up front. I don't see anything of the audience. You have to handle that, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too bright. Thank you. Thank you for this really interesting talk, Judith. Um, I, my question refers actually to this Compass software. We are used to, um, I would say, fairly inconsistent verdicts of judges. How come that we have such higher expectations for software? Uh, that's the first question. And the second, if it's true that there is no ultimate uh, level of fairness, as um, as uh, you you mentioned, and we have also seen in in various practical examples. What would then be the standards that we apply or should apply, both to human beings and AI-based decision-making systems? Are these the same criteria, or should they be different? I think the basic requirement that we have both for the, should we that we should have both for the for the judges and the systems is impartiality, right? I mean, this is sort of like the norm that we, that we're expecting them uh, to strive for, and of course, we know that many of them are not impartial and may not be have their own biases, but that does not diminish that this is the highest norm that we have um, for those. And I think um, we would be, uh, it would be really a, a major problem if we were to give up this even as a goal for ADM systems, just due to the fact that humans are not fulfilling it, right? Because, because if we basically say we're not even striving for that, for ADM systems, then this is, this is flawed to begin with, I would say. That's my first answer. The second is, um, if you cannot um, optimize a system for all uh, groups, right? You should at least, but, but the least thing that systems employed in such a sensitive issue should uh, be required to do is to demonstrate what methods they used and what they did in order to check whether or not they are discriminating against um, um, gender, race, religion, these salient categories that are protected by the law, right? I mean, this, I think, should be, should be required that this is laid open. 
And once this is open, then at least people can contest it, right? Even, even if we can't make it perfect, we can at least say we, we tried our very best, and here you can see what we did, and if you know something better, please let us know, right? Um, and the third thing is also, if you have to decide between, let's say, different ways of optimizing, right? Because at some point, you may have to choose, are you optimizing, you know, what, what is the the best you can get in that particular case. And I think then what, what needs to feed into that decision is who has been least advantaged previously, right? And the, so basically, to, to an extent, this, this would be Rawlsian, to say those who are most severely affected for them, um, you should look at those and try to make, make up for this, basically, right? So, and th there is no, you can't, uh, you can't say this for any, you can't say this without taking a look into the, into the culture and the society in which the system is being used, because you need to check, basically, who are the most marginalized or most negatively affected people previously, let's say, in the justice system, and probably there are statistics on that, and that's probably what you should try to alleviate to a certain degree. Was that somehow already answering isn't it also a question of not only looking at the marginalized, but working with the marginalized, as in uh, having, having them having their say um, in policy? Of course, this was what I was trying to refer to earlier also in my talk, that you need some participation, right? But in order to figure out who all needs to participate, yeah. you should probably also have a look at, you know, at what's happening in your, in your country. And, you yeah. know, data helps, but also education yeah. helps yeah. and history. Is there another question from the audience at the venue before we go to the digital tool and see what's up there? There's one more. Is there one more? Please. So, um, thank you again for the talk. I'm here. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in my bubble, I also just hear negative things about AI in general, like I'm wondering where is all the good stuff. Um, my question is, um, is in regards to exp uh, explicability. So um, from what I read and, and watch, you have this problem that if you want a precise AI system that like, has a high um, rate of precision, it will be so complex that it's, even if you lay it out, it's hard to explain why the, uh, the AI system took this decision. And then there's another argument which says even if we open it up and we make it open source so you can look into it and see why the decision has been made, it would open up the door for reverse engineering, for people taking advantage of this, of understanding how the system works and understanding how to bypass the system. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you hinted uh, at these topics in your talk, but my question would be, should we buy these arguments? Like, are there positive examples where these arguments are actually valid? Or is it complete, um, yeah, just nonsense? No, they, they, are, they are partly valid, uh, and the question is, are they made in order to deter people from making things explainable, or are they just acknowledging some, some limitations, right? Because I think, in, of course, um, uh, you know, what is used under the heading of machine learning may be more or less complex, right? And, and if, it's, if it's really complicated deep learning systems, then it's really difficult, uh, if not impossible, to figure out how exactly a system came to its conclusions, right, or to its predictions, basically. And then, of course, you may make certain steps more explainable by, by basically documenting the different uh, thresholds. And the question is, but then at some instance, you may have to weigh um, accuracy against uh, explainability, right? And you may have different, different domains in which you can accept that stuff is not explainable if the performance is good, if the accuracy is very good. And in other domains, you may decide here explainability and giving reasons for how, why a decision was, was made this way is so important that we can't rely on, on, on systems that we don't understand, right? And, and this decision in itself is an ethical one, right? To, to decide where do we need explanation because it's, it's very important and where do we, um, where can we give up on explanation because the accuracy is higher. Just think of medical diagnostics, right? Yeah. What, what would be, you know, what would be an adequate threshold if you have to weigh these tools? If you, if you have a perfect tool, let's assume you had a perfect tool that is, that is distinguishing um, cancer, cancerous and, and, and healthy tissues, right? Maybe you want to give up some explanation in, in just to increase the accuracy, but maybe in other domains you want to be able to give some explanation. So there is a, so I think you can work on this threshold, uh, but it's, it's also costly 
it's it's you know it, it doesn't come for free explainability so you have to think about where it's important where it's essential and when it comes to reverse engineering of course you know this is what this is what you all have in in, in software optimi sorry in search engine optimization the moment people understand how something works they can also uh, make it work for their, their purpose and then it's basically it's it's the same in security research is a bit of a um, what do you call this um, uh, Wettkampf. So, you know, sort of like people are fighting against each other and you always have to keep up with it, basically. There's, I think, no way of circumventing that. Thank you so much. Let's look at our tool, at Slido or Twitter. Who can tell us something about that? Excuse me, one more question. Could I ask one more question? Sorry. If it's short, we actually really wanted to talk. Can, can you just wait for five minutes? Because yeah, we're sure. just right there um, uh, yeah. listening in to okay. Slido and Twitter. But I come back to you. Can you raise your hand? I, didn't, I couldn't see where you were no. sitting. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. And there are a few questions on Slido. I'm going to start with the first one, which is, um, I work in academia in a computer science department. Our staff is about 80% male and white and also very uninterested in these topics. How do I engage people typically not affected by discrimination to care about ethical issues? Um, I, have to, I have to say I'm, I'm quite spoiled um, because in, in Hamburg I think there has been quite a high interest both on the, um, from from the faculty, but also from the students. Um, so, from you know, I can't say from experience how you get get it started, but it takes some time. So, what helped? Um, to get this, I think you need to start first also with the students, right? And the, the first way to get them is you have, if you, if you get to know them already in the first semester and they get interested in, in your work, because what we really realized in the last year is that um, now that I have a, a mandatory lecture in the first semester, we end up getting more and more students in all our other courses. So it's a bit of bootstrapping the system, if you wish. Um, and for the, um, yeah, for, for the for the faculty, I think it really depends on the department, uh, and I don't have any good advice on how to um, how to convince people because it is really true. If you don't if you don't see the issue because you're not the one affected, you may be less interested. Um, but I actually do think that there is an increased interest, at least from 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 younger students. Uh, I think there has hardly been as much interest in ethical issues related to technology as in recent years. Um, sure. Um, yeah. So as I said, that may be not very useful because um, I really felt there is a lot of interest, but if you have to bootstrap it, I think it, it can only be by trying to point them to some of the flaws that have been happening to use maybe some of these cases um, and explain uh, how high the impact can be of... of um, People always think about other, tech, other people's technologies as being biased and not necessarily what they are doing in their own research. I think this is the, the most interesting part I find in working with my colleagues, that it's always harder to point to potential biases in people's own research than in research or tools that you find elsewhere. Can I give the easy answer here? Uh, of course. <laughs> Just tell them that uh, discrimination is a software problem. I think the awareness <laughs> will be much higher in no time when it comes to your colleagues. Is there another question from Slido? Maybe a couple? Or from Twitter? I don't hear you. Um, there you go. Is, yeah, okay. Uh, another question from South America is um, from the point of view of social eth ethics, what do you think about the massive number of jobs being replaced by AI? That is, of course, yet another issue that I didn't even touch. Um, so the, what is always quite interesting is that when people talk about um, automation and loss of jobs, there, there, there's always the reference to this has been happening all the time and there are usually new jobs coming up and old jobs disappearing and the same may be true uh, now with AI and robotics. The problem is also just that this doesn't help the person whose job has been replaced if they don't get trained to do something new. So I think that there will be massive transformation it will also um, affect people who have previously not been affected so much by automation. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not, I'm not trusting, talking about trust, uh, the narratives that we will have so much spare time if all our you know, jobs will be done by machines because usually that time gets quickly exploited. So I think for that we just need very strong um, social security measures to f basically uh, counter this. Um, for this time being when there's, you know, a change in jobs and stuff like that, to, to also help people transitioning to potentially new jobs. 
And there is another question from Twitter, from Joshua Allen. How should ethics be designed for AI systems that work on a global scale, and who should design it? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the problem is really that, um, as I was hopefully trying to make clear, at least implicitly, is um, that ethics for me is not you have a fixed set of rules or guidelines and you just apply them, but rather it's about negotiating and trying to find out um, um, what is right and what is wrong and what your reasons for this are. And of course, you know, we're not living in a worldwide democracy um, and that, of course, p poses its own issues. I think for those companies who now have a worldwide influence, the least they should do is, and that's a, that's a delicate balance, right? On the one hand side, you don't want to just um, bring your own values with them and think they just work everywhere, right? Uh, so you need to attune to a certain degree to the local specificities and, and some of the, um, the flaws and made, and flaws is too, too soft, but some of the major scandals of, of Facebook for not taking into account how their technology may be misused in certain, uh, in certain countries is a major issue, right? Uh, but there is, no, there, is no one, there is no one size fits all and there's no easy solution in how to strike this balance between sticking to your own democratic values and sort of like going to a certain degree local, um, but I think the, the bottom line threshold should be democratic values guiding your technology design. Um, Just one more, I think, before we uh, go into the venue again and okay. get to um, more. How do you foresee the role of explainable AI in providing reasons for decision-making processes? To what extent at what extent are companies accountable for the decisions of their MLAs, even though programmers might not understand outputs? So there's, there's actually a difference between um, explainability and accountability, right? You can be very much accountable for your software even if you have no clue how this thing is working, just by the sheer fact that you are deploying it, right? So the question of accountability must be disentangled from the question of explainability. Even if you don't explain it, you may still be held accountable. So lack of explainability cannot be a reason for not being held accountable for what you're doing. There are sometimes debates in self-learning systems to what extent the people developing it and to what extent and the person deploying it are responsible for what, let's say, for harms that are occurring if a system is continuing to learn during a process. But some person has to be made or some institution has to be made um, responsible and accountable for that even if they don't understand it. And then at least, you know, they, they, must, they must be accountable for their decision of not having an explainable system, right? So, um, so I think explainability is important. It is important in certain areas in which we think explainability or explanations are important enough for specific reasons, either because you, uh, let's say, you want to give somebody reason or you're obliged to give somebody reason why they were denied bail or denied credit, and we may want to think this is important enough that you can give reasons, and then you may say, well, then we can't use deep learning in these contexts, right? If, if this is really essential, but then you may have be obliged to use other types of systems. In others, you may want to be, may be able to give up on explainability, but this does not dissolve the accountability. Okay, thanks a lot. I think there was another um, person wanting to ask a question here from the audience. Again, I didn't see it. Please speak up. Yes. Oh, I see you now. Hi. There you go. Thank you so much for taking that question, and thank you so much for the talk. I'm wondering about one specific use of AI, which is face recognition. And given the challenges or the potential of misuse of the technology, I'm wondering, A, if you would argue for banning it completely or in specific contexts, and B, what are ethical considerations um, specifically for that use of technology? That is indeed an issue that, that we've been uh, dealing with quite intensely in the last uh, semester also because we had a number of, of guests in our own lecture series addressing facial recognition. Um, I think it is facial recog widespread facial recognition in public spaces is something um, that should be banned. Um, for the reason that it makes you very vulnerable and the argument that has been made in particular by, by Evan Selinger and Woody Hartsock who are also uh, arguing for a ban of facial recognition technology is what is sometimes often considered to be a bit infamous uh, 
uh, or a fallacy is a slippery slope argument by saying that we get so accustomed and normalized to facial recognition through our mobile phones that we use it all the time that it basically doesn't feel like a big thing when you're using when you're holding your face into some you know for identifying yourself but the problem is really um, on the one hand um, your face is something that is is um, as I, you know, as, as unique in identifying you as your fingerprint, but it's also much more expressive, right? It's something that, that in our, I mean, just think about the debates that we're having now when we are ma wearing masks and the downside of not seeing each other, and that gives you an indication about how important the face is, so we don't want to run around covering our face just because we want to be safe from facial recognition. So I think I don't see any reason for having widespread facial recognition, but the moment you have cameras where you can just upload it as a software, it's just this easy tick of making uh, already an existing infrastructure which you have, the cameras, to just um, um, uh, you know, upload the software and then you have a perfect surveillance system. So I don't see any reason for that. On top of that, there are you know, additional developments in terms of um, uh, emotion, effect recognition, gait recognition, uh, which I think if rolled out, out widely are deeply problematic. Um, I don't think I don't think a ban. You know, the, the banning for me refers to the usage in public spaces, not necess, not, but not to doing research on certain issues. But I think there's. Uh, I would I would certainly um, uh, and have subscribed a ban for banning facial recognition in public spaces. Uh, public faces places. Sorry. I have two more short questions to end this, but before I do this, I'd, I'd like to still ask you one last time if we have questions from the floor, so to speak. This is your turn. Thank you again for coming out. I still can't see you, but <laughs> maybe there's another question coming up. Anybody? Is there another question from the... Okay, there's one. Um, yes, uh, thank you for, for the talk. You know, um, you wouldn't organize a discussion about the ethic use of the nuclear bomb. Uh, you would just assume that there is no ethic use of or, or good use of bad technology. Um, here we are now discussing automated decision making. Decision making which we cannot attribute to a person, which cannot be, for which a person cannot be accountable. So I'm wondering uh, how, how can that be at all ethical if I do not know who has taken a decision and why that decision has been taken, who is accountable for it. So there is no, as far as I can see, no good use for bad technology, even in this case. So my first reaction would be exactly the case of nuclear technology was one when technology, ex uh, technology ethics really uh, took steam, right? I mean, basically, um, the, the nuclear bomb and the question of whether technology is neutral or not, this was one of the first cases, whether it makes a difference, whether you use nuclear energy for energy creation or for atomic bombs, and whether it's just the usage of a technology or whether it's the technology per se that has ethical impact. That's the first side answer to your question. The second is, there is always somebody who makes a choice, right? Artificial intelligence or ADM systems are just not there, right? Somebody made a decision that this is supposed to be automated, and it's supposed to be automated in that particular way. And whoever made this choice of either designing a system in a particular way, or of using a system, or of, of ordering a system to, to automate a specific task is in charge, right? And if this person decides that it's fine to go, um, uh, to, to have uh, uh, this based on machine learning and not explainable, um, then it's fine as so long as people are not obliging that person to, to, you know, that we have requirements for a system to be explainable. But there is never uh, nobody responsible. There's always someone responsible, right? There is no, and, and let me stress this, there is no um, lack of responsibility. It's just, you know, you need to make somebody responsible uh, and that's uh, for designing or using a system. Thank you for this very interesting question. I think it entails maybe another question before the very last questions, and this would be, again, put quite plainly, is there a difference between ethics and AI ethics? Well, um, ethics is, as, you know, I, I was trying to be very blunt by saying, you know, ethics is about what's right and wrong and what's good and bad and what the reasons we have for that. And we can apply it to AI and we can just apply it to something else. The only difference may be that all of a sudden uh, we're trying to also delegate ethical decisions to AI and that's sort of like a second order thing, right? So that's why, it, why AI, AI ethics way may be a peculiar type of technology ethics because it's not just the ethics of some technology that 
that's being used, but it's also about delegating ethical reasoning and ethical decision making into tools. And that makes it more interesting, but in principle, the issues of just, you know, what what is justice and what is fairness, and, you know, they, they are as old, you know, they are older than AI, let's put it this way. When we talk about you know, it's always the R question at the end, R for regulation uh, uh, or policy. Um, we talk about two different levels, or we have talked about two different levels. Well, three, actually, on a global level, on a European level, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, European Commission, and also, of course, on a, on a national level, on the German level. You've uh, advised uh, many politicians, you know, the Deutsche Ethikrat, uh, the Ethics Commission of German Federal uh, Government, and so forth. Um, so, could you uh, map out for us, maybe for the very end, uh, how those two trajectories differ a little bit on a European level and what the German government actually has in mind when it comes to regulating AI? I'm not so sure what the German government has in mind. And, uh, and That's I an answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure it has a mind because, you know, our mind is something usually only individuals have. Um, no, but more, more practically speaking, um, I think what you could see let me start one step back. There have been lots of committees and commissions and there has been lots of advice on what to do about digitalization in Germany. And let's put it this way, it could have been picked up faster and more seriously. And it's not really that, you know, the German government for recent years has been very much at the forefront of digitalization. So I think whatever they do, if it's not... Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not using quotes from the last uh, from the last elections. So let's let's wait and see what comes out of the next elections. Uh, my hopes are high because there has been lots of stagnation in recent years. But the problem is also, of course, you have different ministries with very different ideas of what to do about AI. Some see it basically as you know, you, you will get very different views if you look at it from the perspective of the Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection, or if you look at it from the from the Ministry of the Interior or the mm -hmm. Ministry of, of of Research. And I think. You know, figuring out these tensions about how to make AI useful for the common good, profitable for industries uh, um, as well, right? Um, but also protecting uh, basic liberties and civil rights. This will be. This is what I'm expecting to, from from the new government to come up with some um, some vision on, on how to do this, and not just sort of like delegating the digital into the supposedly still new. Mm -hmm. Just as a very last uh, notion there, we've um, had this very interesting discourse on explicability, someone called it, you called it explainability, you differentiated it from accountability, again, where it comes to IGMI AI systems. Um, would you say there is a regulatory way uh, to actually account for those categories on a national level or on a European level? Do you see policy that would actually uh, guarantee, let's say, explicability of certain AI systems you refer to? I think, you know, I think you need to, I mean, what we advised, I'm not sure this is answering the question, if I'm going off, just let me know, but what we advised also in the German Data Ethics Commission is to say, look, you need to decide which systems are of high enough impact to warrant which amount of scrutiny, right? There may be lots of systems where you don't need some extra regulation because they are either covered by the GDPR or by other types of, mm. uh, of, of systems. But there may be others for which, for which you need new regulation and then it doesn't suffice if this is just a German law, but it needs to be a European law, mm. right? And something similar to the GDPR just for algorithmic systems. Could you give us an example of what kind of system that would be? Well, something like this, um, this this compass system, right? If you yep. if you were to use this, but also systems that you use for um, for you know giving people credit or or not giving people credit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, to a certain degree, you must check that these systems are not systematically discriminating against people if they come to very basic foundations such as credit housing, um, you know, all, all these basic things, in particular, of course, if the state is a provider, mm -hmm. social welfare is a massive uh, arena where uh, database systems are currently, you know, or at least increasingly getting deployed, and of course you want to make sure that these are properly audited, and this, you know, and, and this is something you need to mandate and say this is this is a level, because it's either, you know, systems that are either obligatory, right, mm -hmm. Th these are the red flag systems, because if something is obligatory for every citizen, they must be open and tested, yeah. right. 
Thank you so much, Judith Simon. We see each other in November. We don't know exactly when, what the date is going to be. There's going to be a fourth session uh, of making sense of the digital society sometime in November. We'll let you know. But for now, thank you again for coming out after all these years, I was going to say, after 18 months. Uh, thank you for being with us. The terrace is open. And thank you, Judith Simon, for being with us from Hamburg. Thank Judith you. Simon. Mm -hmm.